Hey everyone, I'm Steve from GamersNexus.net and we are back for the third episode of Ask GN, which as some of you already know, we take comments from YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, wherever, and take a few of those and then try to answer them in video form. So that is what we're doing today. We just got back from PAX Prime 2015 and that trip was preceded by a tour of Logitech's audio studio, which is actually, it's really cool. It's more than a studio, it's an engineering lab. And we walked into an anechoic chamber, which cancels basically all of the sound and echoing that you get naturally off of walls and from people's voices. Very cool stuff. A lot of that's already on the channel and all of it's already on the website. So definitely check that out. A couple of cool things we saw at PAX would include on the software side, we saw Roller Coaster Tycoon. That was a big hit in terms of content. Saw Sword Coast Legends and a couple of other games, Battleborn, what have you. And we liked some of them. We found some of them mediocre but we'll continue covering those as things progress. So let's jump into the questions for Ask GN Episode 3. First of all, this is a pretty easy one. This is a question from VG a couple days ago, and VG says, I have the G910 keyboard, and when I plugged it in, the lights got on and stuff, but it cannot type. Yes, it can lower volume. Please help, Please help. smiley face. So I, I don't know if this will resolve this specific issue, but it is something that I wanted to make a point of in a video or an article because this is actually a pretty useful tip for everyone doing anything with system builds. When you have issues with a keyboard or mouse or other primary input device not detecting or not working, the first thing you should do is move it to the top USB slot on the motherboard. So your motherboard has multiple controllers that handle USB and I.O. and one of those controllers is going to communicate directly with, with the CPU, work directly with the CPU, no aftermarket soldered board stuff going on. That one is the one that occupies the top two or a few other slots in the motherboard on the I.O. panel, on the output of the motherboard. So you should connect your input devices to that slot, and that should resolve it. I would think it would resolve this issue because this does sound exactly like that where the keyboard is effectively receiving power for G VG's keyboard because it's displaying the lights, but no input is being received by the system, which tells me there's like a controller issue or a driver issue in Windows somewhere uh, with installation. So that would be the first thing I would do. And that's a useful tip for anyone who's having issues with input detection on a new build. And then the next thing you should do is install all the drivers. And if you think you already have them, then open up Device Manager and double check. And this is something that everyone, if you haven't already, you should all do it right now anyway. If you just open a, a run prompt by doing the Windows key and R, and then type in devmgmt.msc, devmgmt.msc, that will open Device Manager. Click through all those, make sure there are no yellow banes or red X's. And if there aren't, great. If there are, go install that device driver because you could be losing out on solid state drive performance, SATA performance in that instance, or IO controls or other things like that. It's a very common issue with system builds. The next question is from Just Saiyan, and Just Saiyan says, would 650 watts be enough for an R9 390 and FX 8320? The short answer is yes, and that's really the only answer. We didn't see much more power draw than uh, 400 watts or in that range for the R9 390, depending on which one you're using and if you're overclocking when configured with an Intel CPU. The 8320 draws a bit more power, but you're still well under that 600 watt window. You do want 60 to 80% power efficiency with a, or I should say 60 to 80% power utilization, excuse me, with a power supply to get maximum efficiency. So you're still within that range even with that configuration, and that's about where you should be really, and it gives you some room to upgrade in the future. If you're moving to the 9000 series, that's a little bit different because they're 220 watt CPUs and they have some special requirements, but for an 8320, you're fine. This question is pretty long. It's kind of a two-part question. I'll try to answer all of it. And it is by Baka Genius 1001 who says, I help a lot of friends with their first gaming builds. Awesome. Keep doing that. A lot of the time building is spent on cable management. I agree with that. And making the build look decent. Do you have any tricks for quick and easy cable management? For example, an order you connect components to make routing and tying cables behind the motherboard easier. So that's part one. And we do have a video on this. It's a bit outdated and I've changed my technique substantially since then. So I, it's still worth seeing. 
but we've definitely changed a lot since uh, producing that video. So the order of components is something that does help a lot actually in my experience. And what I do is I always install the video card last for starters, that's the easiest thing to do because you want to route those cables last. They're skinnier than the 24 pin cable, makes them easier to work with. And it also means that if you're for some reason forced to route cables under the video card, like an eight pin connector that can't stretch behind the motherboard tray with a, a larger case, then you want to install the card last so that you're not removing it to do that halfway through the process. So that is my first tip for cable management video card last. In terms of other components, I normally do off the top of my head, I think I do power supply is the first or the second, depending on how I feel about the motherboard fit. And then motherboard or power supply, so one of those two first. And then after that, it's just basically I, I pre-install the RAM, the CPU, and the CPU cooler and heatsink before mounting all of that into the case. So that makes things a lot easier. You're not going to be screwing around with the CPU cooler screws, which are sometimes hard to get to once it's already in a case, especially if it's a mid-tower or smaller. So that's the easiest thing you can do in terms of installation order. And then you kind of throw the hard drives in whenever in that process, normally at the end with the video card at the very end. So the next thing I would suggest for cable management is start with the 24 pin and see if it'll fit behind the motherboard tray because a lot of the times with smaller cases it won't or it'll be very tight. And if it's tight, you want to make sure you're routing the other cases through different grommets on the case through different holes so that it's not going under or over the 24 pin. And then definitely you'll want to choose your case wisely because that's the next best thing you can do. So a thing to look for in cases is where do the 8 pin and 4 pin CPU power headers route. If it routes through the top of the case, there are normally three slots on good cases where you want the 8 pin to go through. And that's because motherboards have three different places they put that 8 pin header basically on all motherboards. So the only few cases that get this right currently are N NZXT cases like the S340 and some Corsair cases. But that's the best thing to do, get a good case. And then after that, you wanna start routing the front panel connectors. So that would be your power switch, reset switch, things like that. I get all of those and I zip tie them at the end so that they're all held together. And I just route it through one of the grommets at the bottom and I always zip tie it to the hard drive cage scaffolding, we'll call it, where it's a straight line down. So if you have that in your case, I would tie the front IO to that to kind of keep it hidden and out of the way. So that's kind of basic what I would start with. And then from there, you can buy things like cable combs, they're called, which really neatly handle the individually wrapped cables. So that's a really nice way to make the cable setup look good. And you can see that in one of our PAX videos where we looked at a main gear system. Next question in this two-parter, what is the actual performance difference between a custom water cooling loop versus a closed all-in-one solution like the H100i? So this isn't really linearly comparable in a lot of ways because a closed solution is super easy. It's just one component and it requires no real effort to install over an, addition, uh, over an original air cooler or stock cooler, whatever. So with a closed loop cooler, the main advantage is ease. You can install it very easily. It still gives you a lot of performance and it's decent for overclocking all the way up to pretty high level overclocking. An open loop cooler mostly looks really cool and you can customize the fluid. You can customize the tubing, make it rigid, which is really hard to do by the way to, to bend the tubing and it just makes your system look a whole lot better. So that's the main thing with open loop. Now answering this question, there is a thermal impact. I don't have benchmarks for you, but there is a thermal impact because now with an open loop cooling solution, you're routing the liquid through multiple components. So the CPU, the video card one, video card two, potentially other things, some other boards support liquid cooling for the VRM, and then back into the reservoir, radiators, things like that. Depending on your setup, the liquid cooling in an open solution can be better, it can also be warmer. So it just depends on how you set it up because you've got more components on the loop. So either way, definitely your video cards, VRM on the motherboard could be cooler. And that's probably the main advantage, but it really is mostly just looks. And for most users, I would recommend an AIO closed loop solution. The last question here for episode three of Ask Jan is from Tran Luan who says, could you please answer in detail 
How important is the main board in terms of gaming? Is having a high-end main board going to get you a better gaming experience? Thanks. So, main board in this instance is the motherboard. Both are correct terms to use. And the motherboard directly will not impact your FPS in almost all instances. There are some cases where, through various contingencies, this is not true. So, for example, the LGA 2011 boards, there are some ASUS boards with extra pins that will give you additional overclocking headroom. This is proven. And in that instance, you would get greater FPS because you have more room to overclock. But it's not just you buy the board and you instantly have plus 10% FPS. It's not quite that simple. So the direct answer here is no. You won't have a better gaming experience directly from your motherboard purchase. But again, contingencies exist. So if you're buying a $50 motherboard, then yeah, it could absolutely impact your experience because it might be bad or it might have trouble with power management, which could cause instability. It will have difficulty overclocking if it can even overclock at all. And it could just really deliver unclean power to the CPU, to the video card, things like that, which produce unstable clock rates, unstable driver to component communication and things like that. So yes, it can impact experience, but not directly. So generally, if you're buying a decent board, meaning probably in the 70 plus dollar price range, you're gonna be okay and you're gonna have about the same gaming experience as someone who bought a $150 board. Where this differs is with, again, overclocking, with your memory configuration in BIOS, with other BIOS utilities, with flashing, with support for additional storage devices, additional controllers on the motherboard for those devices or I.O., uh, basically aftermarket ICs and controllers on the board that augment or add to or amplify what the chipset is natively capable of. So that would be additional USB 3 headers, uh, additional I.O. in the back, stuff like that. So that's where you get your main advantage with buying a more expensive motherboard. I do definitely recommend buying at least a decent board. I wouldn't go too dirt cheap because it will bite you in the end. but you don't need to buy a $150, $200 motherboard for every system build, especially if overclocking is not of interest to you. If overclocking is of interest to you, it is very important that you buy a board with quality components because the VRM, which is comprised of capacitors, chokes, MOSFETs, and the heatsink, the VRM, you want it to be high quality. You want it to have enough phases to clean the power delivery to the CPU to produce a stable overclock. You want it to run cool so that the... VRM heat sinks are not just incinerating your uh, your other nearby components like memory for instance and you just want it to actually overclock well and in BIOS the amount of options available to you is dictated by what the motherboard manufacturer supplies what their firmware is capable of so that is another item to look at uh, one of our test boards I believe is an ASUS ROG board and that has a ton of options for memory tuning all the way down to fourth or fifth level timings. So what that does is that allows us to mix and match, in our case, three different kits of memory. You should not do this ever, but we're doing it because we had three different kits of memory. They're all very good, and we wanted to use 64 gigabytes. So in this instance, we had to spend a few hours tweaking and tuning all the memory settings in BIOS to get them to run together without crashing, and that's something you can only really do with a high-end board. So that's an instance where the use case actually does make sense. But hopefully that answers it. Spending $200 in a short will not just boost your FPS. It's not that simple. Overclocking, different story. You should spend more on a board that is actually going to be good for it. So that is all for this Ask GN Episode 3. I'm freshly back from PAX and the Logitech Tour and a short trip to Whistler and a few other things. So. It's been a long week. We've taken a short break from video content, and I hope you've enjoyed everything you've seen so far. If you have more questions for us for Ask GN, please post them below in the comments because I check this video first when I'm trying to compile questions for the next Ask GN video. Not that we have a huge tenure of that, but you know, it's starting. As for Patreon, we're up to quite a few backers now. I think it might be 13. So huge help. It's really exciting to see more backers join us on Patreon. I know. Keegan, who works on the videos, and I are both really happy to see support building outside of traditional advertising revenue, which is very difficult to come by these days, and direct support from the community 
is kind of cleaner anyway and makes for easier content production without the different things that advertising may bring with it. So huge thanks to everyone who has supported us on there. We're trying to get some new stuff together for you guys, like a uh, chat room for community supporters and direct access to us, our editors, for support with system building and troubleshooting and things like that. If you're interested in being one of those people, hit the link in the post roll video. Otherwise, subscribe to the channel, check out all the other videos. Let us know what questions you have for next time, and I will see you all next time.